I'm obviously happy to be associated with CI and doing whatever I can to contribute towards the growth of the ecosystem. Uh, I couldn't be more delighted than I am to have with me uh, Atul Dhawan, who is a friend as well as uh, one of the leading thought leaders at Deloitte. Uh, is currently a partner at Deloitte, but has also spent 40 years with experience across the gamut of things, whether it is audit, governance, strategy. He has seen uh, Deloitte and companies from the lens of being a chairperson, uh, coordinating board member of South Asia, as well as many, many boards that he has been part of. I think he has led senior leadership roles as chief strategy and innovation officer, as well as regional managing partner for the North uh, at Deloitte. He's also currently the chair of uh, American Chamber of Commerce in India. He's on the board of Thai. He's member of CI National Council, uh, US-India Strategic Partnership Forum, so on and so forth. So I think if I uh, summarize it all, I think he has the vantage point of seeing companies as well as different businesses from a very unique lens that each one of us can extremely benefit from. And particularly for the topic today where we are going to speak about uh, very specific elements of corporate governance because we hear this buzzword a lot like corporate governance and in startups as well as what is the role that an independent director can play as startups grow from a simple idea to a much bigger organization, a unicorn organization or a public organization? What does this journey mean and what kind of steps may be required during this journey uh, from his lens and what he has seen and the best practices? So without further ado, I would jump in. Uh, welcome, Atul. Uh, extremely glad to have you today. Uh, thanks, Rahul. Thank you so much for having me here. Just a small correction. A lot of stuff you said is actually past tense, but I'm happy to continue keeping credit for that. So <laughs> this is human being at the end of the day. But thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, thank you. So I'll start with the topic, I think, more on independent director, because I think we hear, uh, I think most startups go through the journey where initially they would have founders and investor directors. Uh, but there is this growing term and you probably get this term as soon as you're starting to think about public. So what is an independent director? Why does one need one? And what is the right timing for a startup in its journey from all the way seed to IPO when they have to start thinking of bringing in this person and what should one look for in this kind of a person? So let's just step back a bit, Rahul, in terms of why do we... The timing for governance and the timing for different governance stages an organization needs to have. And by, uh, we won't go in right now into why you need governance. That's a very obvious uh, question. But, you know, one of the things that I, I do advise different startups is that governance is as much, has to have as much importance in your life as a startup founder as your as your business model it has to be an integral part of your business model it's very difficult to to try and bring governance at a later stage in a company so if you don't get it right the first time around it becomes pretty expensive and pretty difficult to do it later so it's not to say that you do a very mature board of the startup and that that's where i'm going to start by saying you start by putting in governance rules and, and models as when you start your company. Keep that always at the back of your mind. You don't need, when you start, you will start with promoters, maybe promoters, friends and relatives, some other investors represented on the board. But as you start progressing down your business, you will start finding the need to bring some other skill sets. Uh, onto your board to balance the complement of skills you already have. That's the time to start bringing in outsiders. I'm not using the word independent right now. That's the time to start bringing in outsiders to your board to balance the skill complement you have at the board. Now, also remember, there is the role of the board is governance and stewardship. The role of execution and delivery is that of the management. 
the two are complementary. So you create this institution called the board that helps define the vision, helps set the direction of, of the company, helps set the, the strategy, and then takes accountability of that. As you get more and more investors into your company, as in when you start getting more stakeholders into your company, you need to start getting your board to uh, comprise individuals of, that are independent in mind and spirit that can then give you a point of view and also act as an effective oversight uh, on your company. Uh, typically, what we say is that a startup needs to go through four stages of growth. I mean, this is just a model. I mean, you can have different uh, models to do that. So when you start and you start a new company, you set up a board of that company, it's at an early stage. That board really will concentrate on compliance, maybe direction, maybe a little bit of vision and strategic planning. And it's some financial and audit reviews. So it's very basic stuff that you do. As, as the company starts evolving, then you start expanding the role of the board. And as you expand the role of the board, you start giving more oversight powers to the board. You it also remember as your company expands, you're also expanding the management structure and the management organization. So the CEO also then needs help to be able to track and manage. And uh, the board then becomes a, a both a, a challenger and an ally uh, to the CEO to help improve, uh, help add value uh, to the company. Then you come to a stage where you move the company to a growth path. At that growth path, your, you know, your risks also start increasing in the business. And that is the time you start enhancing again the, the quality of the board and the, uh, the work that the board does. The board will start looking at risk. The board will start looking at compliance. It will do at oversight of the financial and audits. It will start looking at you know, what kind of independence is there in the company, what kind of related party transactions. I could go on and on. Here is where, you know, people who are independent start giving comfort to the world outside that the governance has got strength and the company is somebody we can do business with. And it is then, it just adds to the value of the company and the trust that the company then develops with the world outside. And of course, as the company moves into the maturing phase, you may go IPO, you may not go IPO. The workload of the board increases and then you start getting more people that can then take on additional responsibility and take on responsibility that could be independent. So things like audit committees, things like remuneration committees, and things like you know the risk management committees. Different sectors will have different requirements of committees that the company will need. But it eff effectively, again, reinforces the trust and reinforces the um, connect with the external stakeholder community. So when you get independent directors, it's probably when you start moving into the evolving uh, and growing phase, you start getting people. You don't have to necessarily wait for a regulation to kick in. So, Got it. Yeah, so regulations are regulations. Regulations are derived from what is a business necessity at the end of the day. But you don't have to wait for a regulation to kick in to do something. So if you're going to do quality governance, start looking at quality as uh, processes as early as you can. Got it. No, wonderful, I think, description. You, I think you touched upon a couple of points which are also related to just that the, the founders can start to become inundated. They Most of the founders in India start with a kind of a tech background. They don't want to deal with all the financial jargons and uh, the compliances that uh, both from a legal and secretarial point of view that uh, may be required for the company to succeed and scale properly, right? So I think it is very, very important that at, or in those times you start to bring in the right kind of people even at a board level to introduce that fiduciary responsibility uh, and that seal of uh, uh, that everything is actually done in the proper manner. Now, you touched upon a point, I mean, a lot of those points seem to be uh, more the skill set related, skill set and thought leadership, which the founder may 
founder or investor board might might not have and therefore um either advisory or independent board director brings brings that kind of now in this what do you see as i mean like we have seen cases where there have been like uh, uh, for a lack of a better word i would say trophy board of directors uh, and uh, there can be skill set right so uh, what is your view in terms of pros and cons because i mean definitely there is a certain amount of uh, credibility then you start to have extremely named people on your board but also it may come with uh, depending on the stage of company its own cons so do you have a view on like is it like go for skill set go for brand name go for something like which is appropriate for the stage of the company what do you recommend for founders here sir? i i want to start with that trophy board as you called it <laughs> i think i think that it's probably it's a very cute term i never you never heard that term before <laughs> but I, th i think it's uh, i think the trophy board if you the way you call it and the trophy members of the board would be playing a very high risk game individually so i i strongly believe that if somebody wants to be on a board whether it's a private board whether it's an independent director whatever role on the board you want to play if you're not going to invest in it if you're not going to be aware of your responsibilities on it i think you're playing with fire right okay. things can go yeah. wrong yeah and, and then you will you will also then betray people's trust who are believing in you um a board is a lot of work i mean i was reading some uh, re research reports both globally and in india a director would normally spend in a mature company a board director would normally spend between 200 to 300 hours per year in in a company right so and, and that has its own downstream implications and we can come back to that a little later mm -hmm. but if you don't make that commitment um i think you will be risking the anger of the stakeholders at some point in time so it doesn't matter whether you're uh, i mean the more uh, you, the term you use the the brand brand uh, the trophy board <laughs> boards, try the trophy boards i i mean i would be very i'm hesitating to respond to that but i would be very averse to trying to be a trophy board i mean you want to be a board you've got a responsibility stick your neck out and talk and, and do to play your role i don't think anybody should take on a board role uh just just to get a label for themselves that doesn't work got it no fair enough so i think therefore for founders it is very important i think you threw in a number which is very interesting that i mean a typical board member might spend whatever 100 to 200 hours and if you don't have a board member willing to commit that much time then no, it's no, a wrong thing hours, uh, i have the reports i'm seeing is 200 to 300 hours wow depending okay. on the sector depending on the sector so something like financial services is very intense got it got it right so i again the, uh, while i was just getting ready for this conversation today i just picked up a statistic some of the banks have had 26 meetings in a year wow uh, so that's that's a lot of work and a lot no, of no that's 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 totally and i i sometimes wonder because i think i've seen investors also sitting on like 20 plus boards so which means ideally i mean assuming that they also have to do the same amount of job you're talking of like 6000 hours are gone i mean like where is like, the time for additional investing right i mean uh, as so there's, a, there's a joke we have in the audit profession that if god sees your time sheet is going to laugh yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is uh, that is i think this is very interesting yeah. uh, stat i'm going to use it in uh, yeah. maybe conversations with people and also challenge sometimes because i do think that there are probably board members who spend much lower number of hours and maybe then they have to think about are they doing enough justice to the role and the responsibility that comes associated with the role yeah. so yeah, but, but rahul, rahul just what i there could be people who have sufficient experience knowledge or the level of uh, experience 
by which they may be able to quickly go through and do lesser number of hours. But this is a, the report I'm referring to talked about an average of 200 to 300 hours. These are both India and global numbers. Got it. Got it. Now I'll jump to a more provocative sort of a thinking. Could you cite one or two examples? I mean, without the name as uh, where you think a role of an independent director uh, could have could have or has played an important role in avoiding accidents, uh, whether it is in terms of the risk you talked about, financial fiduciary that you spoke about, related party transactions, any of those where you think either having an independent director you've seen like that getting avoided or not having the one probably uh, sort of led to that kind of uh, scenario being encountered. So, Ram, And it can be startup or even non-startup. So I, I, I'm going to give you one lighter observation on that one. Yeah. one. One specific, and of course, I'm not going to go into the company names, and this is something that happened. Where some we were, and I was in the room when this happened. Um, I, I was also caught off guard. Where somebody raised this, we were discussing cyber controls and cyber management in an organization. And you had an independent director of that company who had experience in risk management and cyber controls. And he asked a simple question that Do you have insurance for a data breach or for a cyber breach? And the answer was, yes, we do. And what people had missed out, and he pointed out, was the insurance for cyber requires you to constantly update your systems. Otherwise, the insurance is void. Right. Right? So you had somebody with ex external knowledge who's gone through that experience somewhere who was able to point that out. So. There was no breach in that company, but he was able to point out and made a significant value addition um, that if you are not going to be careful, your insurance is as good as dead. Right. Yeah. Right? So to me, that was one of my most defining moments when I heard this. I mean, I didn't know about it either. I, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't know about this thing in uh, cyber insurance. I So... The ability of an outsider coming in who has sufficient business experience, I think can add significant value to what you're doing to bring experiences from elsewhere and correlate it to you. Now, remember, there's one thing, I'm, I'm just going to take the liberty of adding something that you've not asked. What happens is when you're trying to constitute a board, you don't need to get uh, expertise, a very deep technical expertise on the board. You need people with an, who can understand and understand business models because they're not, they not executing, they're not managing the operations. Right. They're right. keeping, they're doing an arm's length, uh, you know, oversight and helping provide inputs and guidance to the company. No, I think you said right. I mean, like it's the, uh, it's the right questions being asked and probably covering for the blind spots that, uh, that a team or a management might not be looking at just yeah. because they are also learning and evolving the company and they would always be focused on like the Correct. revenue metric which investor will definitely ask every board meeting how is the revenue doing so yeah. uh, invariably um, uh, there is less questions asked I would say from the investor community also today on some of these aspects rather than the revenue metrics or the profitability metrics so to say right so uh, becomes a great balance uh, let me ask a, a different question. So I think in one, I don't know how many independent directors exist in the country. Is it enough for companies to have it? So on and so forth. I think there is a talk today uh, also that we probably have less number of directors uh, who might be willing to join boards and therefore play that role. But I think there is also this element of women directors. And... Um, I think it would be interesting to hear your perspective. You have been on so many boards. 
uh, I'm, I have always believed leadership <clears throat> comes first and uh, yes, gender is not the, I mean, sometimes we give women leaders, I think it's leaders who are women kind of a mindset we follow. But like, how do you see that women director role play out and uh, uh, why companies should actually think about this uh, as an important thing? Um, a good question. Uh, it's so first let me just address what you said and want to come back to this. And by, I, by the way, I strongly believe we need to get more women directors. Uh, I'll come back. The fact is today we do not have sufficient talent available, at least in India, in most parts of the world, in fact. We do not have sufficient talent available to be able to put the number of directors we want, especially the independent directors. So in India, the point you were making, there are two reasons why we don't get them. One is just the numbers are not being available. And secondly, the, the reluctance to take on these roles because of the extent of work that's actually required and the risks associated with it. Right. So we won't get into the risk issues today because that's a that's a I mean we can spend a full one hour talking about risks in India and abroad. But when you talk about gender, gender is a wider issue across the industry. It's not about an issue at the board. It is about getting 50% of your population into the mainstream and getting them involved in the work that we all do. By the way, we've seen where, and both is again separate, where we've seen that there are skills that women bring in, which are again complementary to, uh, the, to, the, to the males. And it is important to get that, uh, get that into the system. It's not about trying to give parity, it's about trying to get skills on into the front lines and using them to make their contribution to the overall economic and social development. Right? Giving them a say in the decision making, by getting them on the boards, you are creating the encouragement for more and more people to come even down the line, to take up those roles and actually make that contribution to that economic and social development. Fantastic. And I personally have had the pleasure, pleasure of working with some fantastic women leaders. Um, and I totally think that uh, given many of the customers that we are targeting, suppliers, consumers, I mean, sometimes we just forget, like, uh, uh, I mean, the products might be designed for women audience and you need a women in the room. Or That is where the gender also plays a role, because if your target customer segment is women and you have the boardroom full of men, I think there is a problem. Similarly, if you're designing products which are also like for younger population, how do you get more young people into the organization? So I'm going to be a little provocative, Rahul. <laughs> Just because you're designing uh, products for women or for men, it doesn't mean why the other gender cannot be a champion for that cause. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, it doesn't stop it. I mean, it doesn't stop anyone from doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think we need to see, this is a, such a big social issue. I think we need to see some kind of parity or equality between the genders and help create that movement and move it forward. Now, you know, there is a requirement under the company law in India, I'm not sure about in other parts of the world, but in India, it's mandatory to have at least one woman director. Great. On the board. Now, I'm just gonna give you in some- In the public numbers. listed companies. In the public listed companies. I'm, I'm just gonna give you some number from memory, but so don't hold a gun to my head. When that provision was introduced, we had about maybe 13 or 14 percent members uh, of boards as women. It hasn't gone up very much since that time, since 2013, I think, is when that provision was introduced. It hasn't moved very much, right? It has moved to about 17, 18 percent. Like I said, don't hold a gun to my head. But basically, the right. point I'm making is yeah, that number has not moved sufficiently. Within that, there is a concept we call stretch factor, which is the number of boards an individual takes. So we find 
one particular woman would take more votes compared to the men. So we basically don't have sufficient women coming into this. And we need to figure out ways to get them on board. Okay. And I'm seeing a lot of initiatives now play out to mm -hmm. work with women, to train them and help them mm -hmm. uh, uh, get onto boards and take on those responsibilities. Yeah. Now, it's very interesting because I think it's also like we talk about this glass ceiling aspect. I mean, it also plays out in boards, right? Probably that there are uh, not enough women uh, who are able to uh, reach to that point of being able to make it to the board and therefore it's like one women director probably having 10 boards and because there is it's, it's not enough women 10, director. 10 is a little high because the ceiling anyway is seven. So, but it's okay. usually, you go back to my 200 hours per person, there's no way for them to do it. Got for it. any one of us to do it. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay. I'll switch to the topic. I think corporate governance has been a big buzzword of 2023. I think half of the people actually in the startup community don't even know what does it mean. Right, because does it mean the way revenue recognition? Because that was one topic which came up sometime during the year. Does it mean audits being done on time? Uh, what does it mean? So I think maybe just for a minute, what does this buzzword mean, and what would be the top five things that comes to your mind when you think about corporate governance uh, as a buzzword for the ecosystem? I'm going to translate that to what should the role of the board be? And let me just try and talk, uh, talk about the thing about one of the points you were referring to in your in your question. Corporate governance is not about financial oversight. Financial oversight is only one component of corporate governance, right? So mm -hmm. accounting issues, uh, control issues are only segments of corporate governance. Uh, there is a, a little bit, uh, there's a research that we had done last year on how the boards need to evolve with the changing times, right? And one overarching thing that came was that, so when we were doing that, uh, that project, we were talking to different people and we were finding that there was a, a variance between how much time was being spent on the stewardship oversight role and how much was being spent on the govern on the, the strategic advisory side of things. I did speak to one of the professors uh, on uh, management and uh, on corporate governance, and he said something interesting. He says you can't walk away from your oversight role, your risk management, and your compliance roles. You can't walk away from those, but that's not the only thing you do. So you're also setting the vision for the company. You're helping setting the vision. You're helping give direction for the strategy uh, for, for the company. You're going to help look at how, what are the issues that the board or the company needs to deal with. You're going to give inputs over there. So we were discussing that you probably need, the boards probably should spend 25, 30% of their time on risk and compliance. And that's really historical activity. Use committee structures to go into depth in those issues so that the board can be more productive and spend 70, 75% of their time on forward-looking issues. Right? In today's time, in today's time, the forward-looking issues are getting very, very intense. So one of the things that we, we, we would uh, turn around and say is give five avatars to the board. Think of five avatars for the board. So one is what we call the vision provocator, that the board and the CEO challenge each other on what the vision of the organization should be and how does that adapt over a period of time? How, does it, how do you react to pace of change? How do you react to new developments? Mm -hmm. right? And I will come to some of these things that are emerging today. There is a guardian role of a board. So what has been the, what did we set as the performance targets, both in terms of business, in terms of organization. And as a guardian, the board takes ownership of actually where or reviewing and guiding on how those things are need to be achieved. There is a role the board should play on the culture and talent. And it's about not 
trying to manage the HR function, but basically helping the CAO, selecting the CAO to figure out how the culture of the organization should get defined and how it should evolve and how do how is talent managed? Because talent is your key input as just as much as financial capital is. Okay. Uh, the fourth is the board should act as the trust torchbearer, both to within the organization and with the external world. It helps reinforce the company's message it helps reinforce the CEO's message that this is a trusted organization we need to work with. Right. So you were raising the issue about you know the trophy board. A trophy Correct. board will not be able to develop that trust. Correct. Yeah. The fifth one is you are now in a state of perpetual crisis. So we're using the term of crisis compass, whereas you, the board helps understand the crisis and how to react to it and go beyond it. So we had thought that COVID was a crisis and we'll get over it and life will get back to normal. We'll you know, dust, dust off and get up and move again. But guess what? Every day there is a new crisis. Right? And think about it, post COVID, there have been so many geopolitical issues that have come up that have had the risk of disrupting organizations, yet the organizations have responded to those crises. They figured out how to recover from those crises and they look at how to thrive beyond that. Great. I mean, like, I think it's a, probably fifth got introduced during COVID itself. Yes. Because it's, have, it's, uh, now, it's now a perpetual state of motion. You're, you're yeah. always in a crisis mode. Right? Correct. Now, now, the other side of things. There are so many new issues emerging that the board can help and must look at. Also alerting the management teams on how to, how to look at that and support how to address that. Uh, you look around us. Uh, Today's biggest buzzword is the generative AI. So everyone's talking about it, but really speaking, we, we don't know what the potential impact of this is going to be. It's some kind of a Promethean moment that we're looking at. It's an industrial revolution moment we're looking at where things on the other side is going to be very different. That's all we understand. How is it going to play out? What are the impacts? I think is a day-to-day -day play out that's happening. So geopolitical risks we've talked about. Climate's becoming a burning issue. But no pun intended. Or climate becoming a burning issue. You see a lot of fires in some countries. So there's so many things that are emerging on a day-to-day -day basis, Rahul. And you've got to have boards that can be skilled to be able to understand it. You don't expect them to become PhDs in it, but they should be able to understand it and help help the management team address it. No, no, absolutely. I mean, these are fantastic points. And I think uh, as we are running, and I like the five-point framework that you talked about, the role of a board. I think it's, and uh, it's not just about, because many a times we just thought about it, it's just financial oversight, but that's not it. I mean, like it's a multiple thing that uh, one needs to uh, bring in and uh, talk about. Um, again, I'll put the point hence, question. Hence the 200 to 300 hours. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of rationalizes the time commitment. But I would also not be surprised at all that I mean, many board members or so-called directors may also not be aware that this is the five-point role that they have to play, right? I mean, like it's possible. It, it is probably true. It is probably true. But that's I think that's the responsibility we, uh, all of us have to get the board standards and the governance standards to the required level. See, think about this again, Rahul. You're, you're, you're one of the pioneers in the startup community. Right. All right. My last data point is there are about 1,17,000 registered startups with Startup India. Correct. Yeah, that's the number I have. Right. Now, out of these, out of these, you need just 10,000 to break through Right, which is not a very large number. Right. 
10,000 to break through and you will completely change the corporate landscape of India. Correct. Right? Correct. That will require massive human capital resources even at the board level. Correct. I mean, if you assume two, two uh, kind of sort of independent board or board or so advisory or whatever, right? You're talking of at least 20,000 positions. And if one person can do maximum two to Seven. three, I yeah. mean, like, yeah. you're like, do we have the 10,000 people who no. can actually... <laughs> and you were, uh, and you were asking about women directors. So here's an answer for you. Yeah, so it seems like a... Uh, quite an uphill task, but anyways, I think this is part of education. I think we have a lot of, I, I would say invested directors would be running in few hundreds. So I think it's also about like, do they upskill in some shape or form also to yeah. play this role, not just limited to when you get the outside board members. Um, now, I think we will have maybe another five minutes and then we have some questions uh, seems like coming in. So we'll uh, move over to those questions. As more and more startups are going public, I think there is this suddenly a crash course of 12 to 18 months to get it right, moving from the private capital market to a public capital market. So I want you to throw light on, and you've seen some of this journey, what is that founders should do, need to do so that they can go public and how does their responsibility change? How does the board's responsibility change? Because you start suddenly starting to have retail investors, minority shareholders, so on and so forth. So I think thinking like a public founder CEO and the board aspects and the compliance aspect. Around. So Rahul, there's one startup founder who's not really a startup again anymore. This is a very old startup mm -hmm. and an extremely successful one. He said something very interesting once. So that that when his company got his first external investor in, when he got his first private equity investor in, he said, I realized that day that this is no longer my company. I know who you are referring because I've been on panel together. So yeah, never mind. <laughs> right? yeah. To me, that is a telling lesson that if you understand that, if you understand that, that you have an obligation to someone else, that you have a responsibility to someone, some other institution, I think you will get your governance right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm. The other thing is, or something that we miss out, is that, and I love saying this in uh, different platforms, is it's not about shareholders only. It is about the wider stakeholder community. And when you are expanding your business, your people are dependent on you. Your people's, your talents, families are dependent on you. Right? Uh, your customers are dependent on you. Your suppliers are dependent on you. So it's so when you, you talk about stakeholder maximization, value maximization today, rather than just shareholder value maximization, All right? Now, there again, the board should play a key role to be able to help the companies to maximize that stakeholder value. The theory I have is that even a small corner shop in a market has stakeholders beyond the owner, even if it's a proprietorship. Correct. Yeah, he has employees. He has customers. He's an. I mean, we as consumers depend on that place. We have a stake in it. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, that's very interesting and profound way of putting it. And I think we get skewed. Probably there is a. Unless you have probably some more people in the room or investors and founders asking the right questions in a board meeting, it can end up becoming a very shareholder meeting versus a stakeholder meeting. Yeah, And yeah. it's important to distinguish between the two. And I know yeah. at Moklex, I think there was a moment in COVID that we realized that we are actually working for eight different stakeholders in the times of exigency. It was customer, supplier, manufacturing ecosystem, startup ecosystem, and uh, the people inside the company and investors was like just one of the eight. 
I mean, like, yeah, and that's right. It was like uh, aha moment that uh, we seem to have a disproportionate element uh, towards investor versus even the people inside the company, right? I mean, like, we, who are the ones working for the shareholders and stakeholders? So, no, I think that's definitely. Right. I'll tell you an interesting story, Rahul. This is about a shoe company. Hmm. Uh, okay. and, and the stakeholder has interdependence. These are not discrete variables, hmm. right? If you maximize the value of a supplier, you will maximize impact the shareholders' value also somewhere. Correct. So it's it's there is interdependence uh, in those eight variables that you're talking about. Okay. So this company is very interesting. In COVID, uh, they had to shut down their retail operations, but they also realized that there was a customer segment that was heavily dependent on their footwear, and so what they did, they actually started hiring vans and taking footwear to the, to the customer in their homes, literally. Wow. Right. So what did they do? They took care of the customer. They took mm. care of their employees. They took care of their production. They took care of the overall company and the shareholders in the process. Right. Right. No, very, very interesting example. So this is great, Atul. I would switch to probably the questions which are now starting to come in. And uh, everyone, feel free to write the question in the Q&A chat, chat box. Uh, maybe I'll pick the first one, which is, I think, the easy one. At what stage should startups start looking at a board, pre-revenue, after getting a few customers, after getting investors? Will they play the role of advisors or auditors? Well, independent directors cannot be auditors. That, that's for sure. That, they, they should not even try and be an auditor. Let the auditors do their job because they are the ones who are responsible for it and eventually accountable for it. I think, um, I, I mean, we can set some kind of basic size criteria for different stage. I gave you that four-stage yes. evolution of a board and the, depending on the maturity level of the company. Um, when you talk, I think the question probably refers to is when do you get independent directors? Correct. Correct. You have to look to people like you. But it probably could make sense to get it earlier. When you, when you cross a certain growth threshold, that would depend on company to company and again, sector to sector. And because the complexity of the regulations of financial services is something that I would look at completely differently. Correct. Because the regulatory framework and the business complexity is very high. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So you, so I don't want to apply revenue yardsticks. I think you define the yardsticks of when is your business reaching a certain critical stage, whether it's of complexity or size, where you start looking for people to add complementary skills to the board and, right. add to the management, and support the management team and add value back. Yeah. Sounds good. The next question I'm going to pick up, I think there are questions probably more also from early stage. What should be the ideal size? How do we determine the size? And what kind of comp should be there for when you bring uh, these directors on board? Uh, the last part I didn't get. What should be the compensation when you bring in uh, the board, independent board directors? That's a very controversial question. Uh, you, you get different points of view on that. That there, well, one extreme view is that there's a, the, the, the Companies Act allows you a certain standard and a certain methodology to pay that compensation. But I keep hearing this a lot that independent directors, the, we're talking about independent directors, right? We're not yes. talking about manage, the regular promoter directors. Rather than no, no, the independent directors. Yeah. So, you do get here a lot of stuff that the independent directors don't get paid sufficiently, that the risk reward equation is not met. I think it has, it's again a very detailed conversation and a very philosophical conversation in terms of where that comp should be or should not be. Um, there's that risk reward equation. There's also this question of will that compensate compensation at some stage impair your independence? So there are different arguments that the market puts out on this. There's no clear answer on that. And it also, again, depends on the company. 
It depends on the kind of work that you're getting, the kind of skills that you're getting. I think it's like any other hiring that you do. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, there are two linked questions. There is no government mandate for private companies to have board of independent board directors. And but it's uh, good practice. But, uh, it's a good yeah. practice too. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good practice to have. Yeah. And is there a way? Because I think startups. Just by the way, Rahul, one second. You know, if you adopt good practices or best practices early in your maturity curve of the organization, it just helps you keep constantly increasing the benchmark standards of your governance as your company grows. Right. And it kind of becomes a little painless as you go along because you've already factored in a lot. You've already built that culture of governance. You've already It's already embedded in your values and culture. Got it. Then there is a question on where do we go? I mean, like, I want an independent director. I mean, people are asking, like, where do, where do startups go to bring in independent I, directors? I, I, I don't have an immediate answer, but I think the MCA or what that Institute of Corporate Affairs keeps a database of people available as independent directors. But I'm increasingly seeing headhunters get involved because the search is getting specific uh, to, to the profiles, the individuals that you want to get. And it's not about just picking a name and saying, come and join my board. Yeah, no, that is a fantastic because I think I've seen uh, headhunters come to us that if you're looking for a board of directors, so probably talk to your recruitment partner. I think that can be a, yeah. a great place. Uh, it's probably a better way to do it than trying to access a database because you need to, again, look at what profile you're getting in and what is the profile that you really need. Right. There is a question which is we are in education and skilling sector and growth stage. We have a chief legal officer who takes care of compliance by large. Is it advisable to have an independent director? It's, I mean, it's circumstantial. I mean, I, as a practitioner, I would say you should, but it's circumstantial. I mean, it depends. Um, I need more information to be able to give you uh, yeah. an input on that one. Yeah, there is a person, women, actually, it's interesting, so I should take this question, ask this question to you. As a woman, I have quit my job at GM level with 15 years of experience at MNC and working on a startup, want to know if I should pursue a dependent director's path. So I think uh, you heard we need 10,000 independent directors in the country, so, and women directors are in large demand, so. Yeah, yeah from a from a market supply and demand perspective, yes. Mm -hmm. But um, hell, you're doing a startup. I would pursue the startup. It's a dream that you're pursuing. Why won't you? Why would you give that up? Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question on how does diversity and inclusion and somewhere ESG also. I'm combining the question play a pivotal role in terms of holistic and democratic work culture and as societal move to all stakeholders. I didn't follow that question. Uh, how does so diversity? How is diversity and inclusion playing a pivotal role in terms of holistic and democratic work culture and as a societal to move towards all stakeholders? So, and this is what we were talking can... about earlier, no, Rahul. Hmm. As you develop the culture of the organization, you, you provide, you start looking and provide for all these attributes. In today's time, um, and by the way, there is a demographic issue here in the sense that with the uh, with the entry of the younger people into the workforce and the average age going down in the workforce, the generation demands action from from companies. You will, I, yeah. So it is possible that you will get impacted on the quality of work quality of inputs you get in terms of people, and quality of what you get to go to the press, what the next, the next day of the NC world, whichever level you want to talk about, if you don't address what they want. Got it. Right? The younger generation is very, very conscious about this. And I'm not saying that we should do this only because they're conscious about it. You know, it's, a, it's actually the right thing to do. One of my leaders used to say this, that these are not just the right thing to do, 
but these are the right business things to do. Correct. 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 No, definitely, I think a great point. Then there is a question around, I think, related to achieve growth. Many organizations might be legally compliant for fear of law, but may ignore moral compass as yeah, there is no fear of getting caught. How do independent directors play a role in this? I gave you the five avatars of the board. <laughs> I, I gave you the five avatars of the board. That would help the independent directors also define their role. Right. But but you're right. I mean, an independent director has to play an active role. Yeah. We are reaching towards the end, I think. Uh, so, Atul, I would uh, love to have uh, just in my takeaway, firstly, a great session. And um, I think the few takeaways I want the audience to uh, remember, one independent director or advisory director, whatever you call it, is a very important role and organization depending on maybe starting series A and B when you start to have at least the basic PMF form, you should start to think about it um, quite actively and build towards it. And it requires serious commitment, 200 hours plus as Atul spoke about. And then he spoke about how the board plays a five-step role, which hopefully will circulate in an email also for the attendees. Um, and it's not just financial control that we are talking about. It's many more uh, beyond that. Uh, and uh, with that, I think we are towards the end. Atul, I would want you to give your closing remarks um, also on uh, the uh, this topic as well as um, any further tips for the startups uh, listening this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I, Rahul, first, thanks for having me in this conversation. I quite enjoyed and, uh, uh, this conversation and thanks for giving me the opportunity to express uh, our views on, on this. So, but my, my fundamental thing that I would give to the startup community is uh, invest in governance, just to invest in your business. Governance is an integral part of your business. It's not something you can postpone to tomorrow. Tomorrow it will become very difficult and become very costly. So the earlier you do it and you keep that at the back of your mind, you will it'll be a very significant input to the successful organization you will create. So take it as part of your investment cost, whether it's time cost, financial cost, whatever, but take it as part of your investment plan. Invest in governance upfront. It is not it is not something to be done tomorrow. Yeah. No, fantastic. Thanks a lot, uh, Atul, for this session. And this session will be available also. Uh, we have recorded the session for uh, others in your team, CXOs, uh, who may not have been able to attend the session. Feel free to circulate the video and look forward to more and more exciting sessions as part of CII Learning and the CII Unicorn Committee. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Atul. Thank, thank you, you Rob. Thank you, Puma. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both of you for taking time. Thank you. Thanks.